Chairperson Holly Pearson. Holly Pearson. Holly Pearson. Here. Board Member Richard Shabaro. Here. Okay. So please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. So the first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the August 20th, 2015 board meeting. We're going to have to put that on at the next board meeting, okay? So item number two is public comment. And the first person who will be speaking is... I believe we have a slip from uh, Barbara. I'm sorry, I don't recall your... Barbara saying yes. Good morning. Good morning. As I stated, my name is Barbara Singh. I spoke in the May 2015 VCGCB meeting too and have made a number of comment entries in that site for May 2015 under the video of the meeting as a way to try to raise awareness about the need for critical changes. I am a victim of discrimination and retaliation, but I am trying hard to heal. I had worked for the state. Last year, I retired prematurely. I feel I have become an advocate. And I just wanted to reassure you, I'm just reading about two pages. I wish to urge that the harassment training become required annually and that all forms of discrimination have a solid focus in the training and not just sexual harassment. State law AB 1825 requires that supervisors be trained every two years. I believe that is inadequate. I believe it is an urgent need for supervisors, including executives, and for all other employees to be trained annually. Discrimination is a national topical issue, and all the associated costs are significant. I wish also to urge that there be a significant penalty for having and or condoning illegal noncompliance. I wish too to urge that the state adopt true zero tolerance for any wrongdoings in regard to discrimination and retaliation. In an investigative interview on 12-7-2011 in the large state department in which I worked for years as a multiple award-winning employee, I reported racism. The HR branch chief typed my reporting racism to her and to the labor relations officer. In that purported investigative interview, she also typed the labor relations officer directing me to drop it, to not keep looking for examples to let them know, etc. Please note the irony and even in regard to their position. The HR branch chief even typed the labor relations officer's deeply offensive direction to me to not keep regurgitating. The labor relations officer retired in 2013. In the following year, in June 2012, I had an Office of Civil Rights investigator making me feel forced to answer her questions in front of my new coworkers, in my new office, in that department, and even with my telling her I had no privacy and was in a cubicle. The acting OCR chief emailed me that that investigator interviewed everyone else active in that department for my complaint in the privacy of OCR offices, which included my HR supervisor. I was the victim and was granted no privacy. It is not safe in that department to report wrongs. Other whistleblowers have found that true in their agency too, about which I spoke in May 2015 here. In the next year, in October 2013, I had a high-level manager also directing that I drop it. And her being so emboldened and in front of another manager to reveal to me, a rank-and-file employee, that she has a discrimination complaint against her which I would learn in the next year from her victim who sought me out that those charges were filed in January 2013. In, Gen in 2014, I was directed by the new labor relations officer that I'm not allowed to pick it as a form of protected opposition against retaliation and discrimination. She made me feel more fear. I later learned that I do have the right to pick it and hope to have the strength to do so on December 7th of this year. I wish for you to really consider 
just how risky and injurious it is for a business organization to have people in positions of, in power who are abusing their power and also feeling at complete liberty to violate policies and laws. In the department where I worked, employees before me and after me filed charges with EEOC, and legal action occurred too. One fellow specialist was reporting via email to HR management discrimination over and over, and her emails were not handled as required by that department's policy and by law, which the EOC senior investigator confirmed in 2012 and in 2013 regarding the May 2011 email, because I read it to him. Despite those facts and the fact of my internal and external whistleblowing over several years about the illegal noncompliance, the noncompliance for the harassment training in the department where I worked was large and long term. My whistleblowing was disregarded, and even when I emailed in 2013 the chief deputy director of operations who left this year, the then director who resigned this year, and the then acting OCR chief, acting internals audits chief, that I am a whistleblower and I wrote about the reckless indifference. Discrimination is costing the state many millions of dollars, which documents from the state personal board attest to including SPB's 2002 discrimination report that identifies the partially known cost for one year was almost 40 million. I called EOC in Oakland last week and learned that the Oakland EEOC now has six investigators and two of them have just finished their training. A DFEH pie chart for years 2008 to 2010 reveals over 50,000 employment discrimination complaints. A DFEH deputy director, who surprised me by initiating contact with me when I was at home, recently informed me that DFEH is no longer tracking the totals. Why not? 50,000 complaints for these three years. Government is supposed to be transparent, too. How many DFEH investigators would it have been needed to even adequately investigate those cases or even adequately investigate half of those cases? So many cases, so many human beings, so much harm. The mayor of Sacramento in a city council meeting spoke on Tuesday night about being preventative in regard to another issue. There, I gave a speech to him and to the council members that night about the harassment training and about discrimination issues. Mandating that the harassment training be annual is a way to lessen harm. The increase in the frequency of the training could prevent some harm since awareness can do so much. I passionately believe that requiring the training annually and for all employees, and not just for supervisors, could help to protect employees and the workplace experience and also city, county, and state funds. When policies and laws are being violated and the violations are being condoned are minimized, then there is no trust or safety or needed accountability. Please consider all the associated costs involved in having workplace environments where there is chaos, cruelty, and crisis. If the lack of accountability is clear, then the situation is very dark. Discrimination and retaliation have enormous costs. My passion and pain result from the profound cost of that on human beings. Please seek today to mandate a legally sound harassment training becoming required annually in all state agencies. Human beings matter. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next public speaker. Um, I believe you have a uh, slip for Mr. Uh, Kulici. Mr. James Khaleesi, is it? Thank you. Test, test, put us on. My name is James Kulosi. Good, mor good morning, members of the board and the public watching at home. I have a short written statement. I stand up here today for the matter of time. I find, find liberties and freedoms are not dictated by time. Six months or 100 years, just yesterday or if tomorrow. 
When the general public demands that our law enforcement wear body cameras because of mistrust, fraud, and corruption in our police force and a government that turns a blind eye across the nation, it goes without saying there's a level of corruption in our local law enforcement in Sacramento. And the district attorney works very closely with the police. It isn't a stretch. I was falsely arrested twice by the same officer and the attempt and concealment of that fact just so shows the guilty. If the Capitol Protection Police is corrupt, what does that say about the Capitol? The staff of this board told me it was water under the bridge. That wasn't water, it was blood. Blood of every citizen who fought and died for our great nation. If we don't stand up for our rights and practice them, they will be taken away. I believe we have a right to stand up for them for this ge generation and the next as we are all Americans. The crimes and concealment and of the malicious and investitory body that governs itself and the code of silence, silence that's evident goes to show that we need an independent body to investigate the crimes of the government, state, county, and city with full transparency. If you could put a vote across the nation on one word, the consensus, consensus um, let's go on would come back being change and it would win elections. Not an artificial change from white to black, but real change. I'm not the first nor the last to, that believe in these beliefs. Just because I spoke them doesn't mean I'm alone in my endeavors as my ideals are not of the few, but the many. Evolution to bring a revolution as it is only a matter of time. Um, that was my statement. Let me see. Also, I uh, went and met with uh, the Department of General Services yesterday and called them about opening a hearing with uh, them about, I think it's the Administrative Practice Act. They told me you first have to initiate the first steps, not me, so what would be the process of going forward with that? Um, after the board meeting, somebody will reach out to you and speak um, to you further about that. Um, in what department? Why doesn't somebody from here reach out to you after the meeting and they'll talk to you about it? All right, thank you. You're very welcome. Is that the end of the public comment? Yes, Speakers I believe so. Possessed? Okay, thank you. So item number three on the agenda is the executive officer statement. Yes, Julie, good, would good, you please give yes, your report? Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Shavaro. Um, a few items uh, for uh, you this morning. Uh, the first one, and I'll let Wayne um, speak a little bit more to this, but I just wanted to highlight that our um, administration-sponsored bill um, AB 1140 um, successfully moved through the legislature and is currently sitting on the governor's desk. We're very proud of um, all of the parties who came together to focus on the issue of modernization of our program um, and seeking legislative changes that we believe are long overdue to help us improve access to the benefits of the program. So we're looking forward to um, uh, the day when uh, hopefully Governor Brown does sign that uh, bill. Um, it moves us into a new era, which is uh, interesting timing given that this is our 50th uh, year uh, running this program. So um, it kind of springboards us into the future and I'll let Wayne uh, report on the details of the bill in his report. Um, in terms of uh, upcoming activities, uh, next week uh, we will hold our first uh, regional conference that is funded by our Office of Victims of Crime uh, federal grant that California received. Uh, that will be on Wednesday of next week at UC Davis. Uh, our guest speaker will be Elizabeth Smart. We're expecting about 270 guests from a wide range of victim services uh, throughout California. Uh, we've had a number of media um, inquiries and there will be uh, facilitated workshops on a number of uh, topics. Uh, later uh, this fall, uh, next month in October, uh, we will do a similar event in uh, Southern California at um, UCLA, and our keynote speaker will be uh, Azim Kamisa, who's the founder of uh, TKF Foundation, 
a foundation which focuses on stopping youth violence. It's a very interesting um, speaker following the murder of his um, son in 1995, uh, which was a gang-related incident. Um, he chose the path of forgiveness and compassion and has established this foundation. So we're looking forward to uh, his uh, comments. And uh, two more items, just reporting back that I did uh, participate in a very effective uh, National Victim Services training conference last month in Washington, D.C., which was uh, co-sponsored by OVC and brought together all the compensation programs and all the victim assistance programs uh, across the, the nation. Um, I was honored to be asked to address uh, the 250 participants to talk about California's successful uh, 50 years of operating this program. So um, I also had an opportunity to then later um, conduct a workshop uh, focusing on our work with OVC and highlighting the research that um, Mindy and, and her team um, have done over the last uh, two years um, identifying underserved victims and the barriers uh, to those individuals in terms of accessing our program and identifying strategies. It, it was, again, very well received. Many states have been in contact with us um, since that time uh, to help uh, them understand how they can better identify those in their states that are under, uh, underserved and not able to um, access the program for a variety of reasons. Um, that's the um, conclusion of, of my report for uh, this month. Lots of activities going on, and I'll have more for you next month. Thank you, Julie. Are there any questions or comments? So moving on to item number four is the legislative update. Uh, Chief Counsel Wayne Strumpfer will give us that update. Thank you, Wayne. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple of quick things. AB 1140, as the executive officer mentioned, uh, did pass the Senate uh, floor and is at the governor's desk. Uh, we've talked about this bill a lot over the past several months. So one thing that uh, did change was that uh, we amended it at the end to include some of Senator Hancock's concerns, including a requirement that all correspondence by victim compensation program to an applicant be written in additional languages if requested. And I believe it's now 13 different languages that we will be uh, providing to claimants. Uh, also, real quick, uh, our government claims bills, uh, AB 165, was signed by the governor. That one included appropriations to pay for erroneous conviction claims of Ronald Ross, Susan Mellon, and Brian Banks, who the board has seen over the past year. Also, currently, government claims board or government claims bill, uh, SB 304, is on the governor's desk. Uh, finally, SB 518, which was uh, Senator Leno's bill on trauma recovery centers, uh, has been held in appropriations and is now a two-year bill. So we'll see that again next year. Um, that's all we have for right now. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or comments? No. no? Okay. So let's move on to um, the government claims program. The next item on the agenda is the government claims program consent agenda that will be presented by Nicholas Wagner, government claims program manager. Good morning, Madam Chairperson, Board Member Shavaro. For the record, I'm Nicholas Wagner, and I will present the government claims program agenda items. Item five is the government claims consent agenda. It consists of 293 claims. Before the board takes action on the consent agenda, item 22 for Thomas Gill and item 114 for the city of Benicia have been removed to consider new documentation. Additionally, item 98 for Justin Carter, item 105 for Richard Stevens, item 132 for Peter Grushaka, and item 270 for Julius Pereira have been removed so that the claimants may address the board today. With the exception of the removed claims, staff requests that the board approve the consent agenda. Do I have a motion for numbers 1 through 293 with the exception of the items noted? So moved. Motion passed. I second the motion. <laughs> okay. Nicholas, would you please brief us on the consent agenda item number 98? I'm going to save 98 until the end. The representative is here, but he stepped out of the room briefly. So with your permission, I'd like to move on to item 105 for Richard Stevens. Okay. Would you please brief us on that? Richard Stevens seeks compensation from the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection and the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation in the amount of $365 for reimbursement of towing charges. 
Program staff recommends the claim be rejected because there appears to be no state liability for the claim damages. Here representing himself is Mr. Stevens, and representing the Department of Forestry is Mr. John Stipley, and representing CDCR is Julie Bull. Good morning. So, Mr. Richard Stevens, do you want to go forward? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, essentially, this has to do with my employment at, uh, with CAL FIRE as a water and sewer plant operator uh, at the Canoc Dye Conservation Camp in Lower Lake. Um, it's actually a focus of attention on the recent fires, the Valley Fire. Um, uh, essentially, my complaint is regarding the towing of a, a vehicle that I had purchased from, a used vehicle that I had purchased from Hertz. Um, essentially, the uh, denial letter that I received <coughs> excuse me, was inaccurate in its portrayal of the events. Um, essentially, uh, it a comment was made that there's a rising problem with people dropping off rental cars uh, for drug deals and possible prison escapes. Now, um, I have to point out that this is a conservation camp. It's a, a mid, uh, early 60s uh, wooden structure camp of about 100 uh, inmates and at any given time only about uh, 10 staff members. Um, it extends only about 200 yards from end to end. Uh, because of the venue here, I do have some photographs to kind of put things in perspective as far as the parking lot where the car was at. Um, however, it was depicted that uh, the Stevens was present when everyone at the conservation camp was discussing an issue with an unknown vehicle being present in the parking lot and failed to realize it was his vehicle that they were discussing. This is very misleading because I was not present during any meeting of such. Uh, essentially, the way things are structured, CAL FIRE comes in actually an hour before I do at 7 a.m. in the morning. Uh, the staff there is five to six people um, at any given time. Um, there are roughly three CDRC employees that are at the other end of the hallway. The administration building itself literally is essentially it's smaller than this room. And um, my office is located right next to the CAL FIRE uh, firefighter's office, administrator uh, Red Hawk Pallison. Um, I come in at 8 o'clock. At 8.30, we check in our inmates for the work crews. Nothing was discussed about anything involving a, a vehicle. Um, Red Hawk was right there with me and I then went to check in my inmates uh, at the other end of the camp like I said less than 200 yards away came back approximately 45 minutes later in my office and then I overheard Red Hawk talking to someone on the phone which I often do because the door is usually open and he said something about a car being towed to which and he, said, and he said something about it being a rental car. So immediately I was alerted. So I got up and saw that they had towed my car just literally less than five minutes before. Um, none of this about there being any meeting. He thought we were present, whatever. Um, Red Hawk has my phone number, actually two different contact numbers with me. So at any time he could have contacted me about this. Now the crux of what they're saying is that you um, uh, I was going to ask the representative in terms of what the policies are because this, it may be that we'll be able to make a correction here, use something useful from this. But um, according to CAL FIRE policy 6440.9, all vehicles parked in camp shall be inspected daily to assure compliance with this section. Uh, make, model, and license number of all personal vehicles shall be kept on file uh, in the CDCR office of a camp. Um, the procedure I followed 
this was probably the fourth or fifth time that I actually had parked um, there at the camp. I typically will take my uh, rig that I have, a uh, CAL FIRE rig. Oftentimes I take it home because I live at the state property right over the hill from the camp uh, because I had gotten this vehicle just a few weeks before. I was still in the process of trying to make a shift because uh, I generally didn't bring my personal vehicles to the camp. Um, and because this was a rainy time, in fact, it was raining during this event, um, it, it made it more difficult for me to make that switch by myself. Um, however, I did speak the first time I left it there, or was going to leave the vehicle there. I uh, went to the opposite end of the building, spoke with Officer Brockmeyer, told him that there was a new car in the, in the lot, gave him the information on it, he said, no problem parked there, like I say, four or five other times, no issue until this occurred. Um, the, the interesting thing about this, and I'm not trying to be accusatory, but uh, the fact still remains that Red Hawk Pallison, who made this statement that, as I said, implies that I was standing, <laughs> uh, that was standing right there with them when they were talking about this vehicle, which I wasn't. Um, and we're talking about a total of maybe six people that they had to talk with, and they were right there in the same room, practically, except that I was not. Um, when the tow occurred, it was probably an hour and a half later. Um, about four to five weeks after this event, uh, Officer Peterson from CDCR uh, came to our end of the building saying, does anyone know who owns this white CRV? There was a Honda CRV that was parked right outside, maybe one parking space from where mine was at. This parking lot only holds about 12, or more than 15 parking spaces. I don't want to cut you off, but if sure. we've got other sure. know, folks on the agenda. But the, so. the, the point is that um, he asked, does anyone know whose vehicle that is? And someone said, oh, I think it's Red Hawks. And so they called to confirm, because Red Hawk was to someplace else in the camp, camp, that that, in fact, was his car. That was the end of the story. But in my case, my vehicle was, was towed in the rain, and I had to get a ride to go pick it up. At that time, I was told that they knew whose the vehicle it was. When they opened the vehicle, it had my laptop, it had magazines, it had mail that was sitting right on the seat. So it would have been very easy for them to establish who owned the vehicle. Plus, Hertz gives me a little sticker that they put in the back window off in the corner. Uh, so unfortunately, it had taken them about two, almost two months before they actually made the, the transfer with DMV. But essentially, I did contact uh, CDRC and let them know it wasn't an issue until this lack of communication. So what I'm asking is that uh, that the board consider, or the CAL FIRE CDRC consider, what methods are used to make a registration and that there's a way that I could then follow up on that to make sure that this happened because I made the assumption that it, business had been taken care of. Thank you for your comments. There's a representative from Cal Fire here. Do you yes. want to state your name, please? Uh, John Shipley. Essentially, the, the department stands behind you know the statements that were made in um, the letter where we recommended rejection. Um, Cal Fire, even though this is a uh, conservation camp and it isn't, doesn't necessarily appear like a typical correctional facility. It is a correctional facility with, um, you know, prisoners there. Um, there are certain policies that have to be in place to ensure the safety, to ensure that nothing happens. Um, one of them is you have to register your vehicle. You have to, so that way they know exactly who owns the vehicle. That was not followed in this case. Um, when they did have discussions, and as he said, it's a very small area. They had lots of discussions. They were calling DMV to try to figure out whose vehicle it was, calling CHP. Um, there was never a situation where anybody indicated that it was Mr. Stevens' vehicle, and at that point, the vehicle was towed, and we think that um, for those reasons that the claim should be rejected. Thank you for your comments. Ma'am, do you have any comments? Uh, Can yes. you state your name? Please. My name is Julie Bull. I'm for the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, and our position is that the claim failed to establish uh, liability on behalf of CDCR. Um, our staff members did not violate any policies and procedures, but we do agree with CAL FIRE's assessment that the claimant unfortunately fall, uh, failed to follow the proper parking procedures. Thank you for your comments. 
and if I could redirect <laughs> briefly, please question is that what is that policy? When you're making a registration of the vehicle, you're talking with the CDRC officer about that, and then he then says, no problem. They have a clickboard that they usually put the vehicles on there, and then I continued to park there uh, several other times without there ever being an issue until this particular morning. Thank you. There is no form you can fill out. There's no in any way for me then and know that they have, in fact, done their, their part of the job. That's, that's my point. So with all the the forms and stuff that we fill out, there is no form. Um, and then in regards to it being a prison, I have to also point out that these are very minimum security inmates. There is no real fence uh, located there. And uh, from the standpoint, they have too much to risk. When I asked the officer that had made the comments about Red Hawk's car, and I made the statement about there being a rising problem with people dropping off rental cars for drug deals, he just sort of stared at me and cocked his head like, is that for real? I mean, that's just not feasible. These people have access to drugs actually when they're out with their, <laughs> in Thank the you. field, so. Is there any? Thank you very much. Thank you for, for taking the time to come here today, all three of you. Is there any discussion on this item? No, I'll move staff recommendation. I second that motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Shipley is going to stay up here because he's representing forestry for the upcoming claim. Item 132 is the claim of uh, Peter Grushaka. Mr. Grushaka claims damages against the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, an amount exceeding $25,000 for damages to land, annoyance, discomfort, and punitive damages. Program staff recommends the claim be rejected because it raises complex issues of fact and law beyond the scope of analysis and interpretation typically undertaken by the board. Representing the, the Grushakas is Ms. Uh, Nancy Grushaka and Br Bradley Carroll. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. John Shipley is representing the Department of Forestry. Thank you very much. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment today. My name is Bradley Carroll, and I represent the Grishaka family whose claim you're hearing right now. Uh, we understand that staff has recommended that the uh, Grishaka's claims against CAL FIRE be denied. Today, we're asking the board to set aside that recommendation. My client, Nancy Summers Grishaka, is here today, and she has requested to comment to the board. Um, with the board's permission, she would like to provide some more information about the claim, and after that, I'll uh, say some more brief words about the legal context of the claim. Thank you. Ms. Grushaka? Good morning. My name is Nancy Summers Grushaka, and my husband and I own a remote property in Mendocino County. We purchased the property in 2006 because of its aesthetics and its ecological values and because a mile of Paita Creek passes through the center of the property. On January 7th and 8th of 2015, Cal Fire illegally burned part of our wilderness property on a no burn, spare the air day, and without notifying us of their intentions. We hike our property, and so do our friends, and we are very concerned for our safety. The mountains in our view shed are now charred. The trees that are not blackened sticks are a cooked orange brown color. After the fire, the smell of fuel was in the air. White patches among the skeletal, skeletal blackened sticks show remains of vegeta vegetation where there was a toxic fire accelerant the Cal Fire dropped from a helicopter and ignited. The ground is hard. It's like cement. No topsoil remains. The sight of the destroyed barren mountainside is heartbreaking. Although not all of the vegetation has died, the land will not recover from fire damage for two more human lifetimes. This devastation is even more tragic because the Paita Creek watershed supports a prime spawning stream for threatened steelhead, which are both state and federally listed. 
This is the watershed that we have worked so hard to protect and restore. In previous years, when fires were set on neighboring parcels, I repeatedly called CAL FIRE and met with them face to face to exp express my extreme fear of fire spreading to our property. I also sent the CAL FIRE Deputy Chief a 2013 video of a raging fire located in the CAL FIRE Vegetative Management Program area next to our property and next to the creek. The deliberate fire was set late in the day. There were very high winds and the fire was next to our property. There is only one road of escape and we are very concerned for our safety. Cal Fire destroyed the aesthetics and they damaged the function of the watershed. Because Cal Fire, after our repeated warnings, deliberately set a dangerous fire on our property, I request that the board reach a resolution that will result <coughs> in a sufficient deterrent to future illegal behavior by Cal Fire. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cooper? Madam Chair and members of the board, what you just heard from Ms. Gushaka gives rise to some fairly simple legal claims. It's clear that this fire that was deliberately set by Cal Fire on the Grushaka's property was a trespass by fire, and it burned nearly three acres of their property. Indeed, as was attached to the Grushaka's tort claim, the Cal Fire has admitted as much in writing. Uh, with all due respect to the staff's opinion of this claim, the case is not complex. There's no question that Cal Fire burned a sizable portion of the Grushaka's property, and there's no question that Cal Fire has admitted they were responsible and that they will be found liable. This only way this case is a complex case is if we are forced to file a complaint in the Superior Court against CAL FIRE that will raise the environmental concerns of this claim. A PRA request from CAL FIRE reveals that the vegetative management plan they were burning under was expired and there was no updated envir environmental uh, impact report. As Ms. Grushaka alluded to, there are serious environmental concerns based on the burn on their property, as well as concerns about endangered and threatened species that may have been harmed. If we're forced to formally litigate this cl those environmental claims, the case does become complex, but that issue is not before you, and it need not be. The simple tort claim is the type of claim that should be resolved by this board in an administrative setting. It's what's best for my clients, it's what's best for Cal Fire, it's what's best for the state of California. So we request that the board remove this item from the consent calendar and refer it to the board staff either for a grant or for, if nothing else, a full staff report and recommendation. Thank you for the opportunity to comment, and I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Mr. Shipley? Um, the department respectfully disagrees with a lot of the comments that were made by um, Ms. Grichaka and Mr. Carroll. Um, however, the department has engaged um, previously in discussions uh, to try to resolve this matter. Um, the department's continuing to engage in discussions on trying to resolve this matter. Um, but in the end, we do agree with the um, board's recommendation that this is a complex matter and it's more appropriate to be um, resolved through a litigation process rather than through the government claims process. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Uh, no questions. I'll move staff recommendation. I second that. Thank you very much for coming and bringing your comments. Thank you very much. Yes. Nicholas, would you please brief us on consent agenda item number 270? Item 270 is the claim of Julia C. Pereira. Mr. Pereira requests leave to present a late claim for compensation from the Department of Forestry and Fire Protection in the amount of $10,000 for damage to real property and personal property. Program staff recommends that the late application be denied for failure to meet the criteria required by Government Code Section 911.6. Program staff also recommends that the claim be rejected because the state is legal immune pursuant to government code sections 850, 850.2, and 850.4. Representing himself today is Mr. Pereira, and representing the Department of Forestry is Adam Donaton. Thank you. Mr. Pereira, go ahead and make your comments, please. 
Thank you for uh, spending time with me today and letting me explain the reasons for my claims. Okay, I'm here today to uh, discuss the destruction and the lack of communication between CAL FIRE and myself and other landowners in my area. Okay. Um, putting a small fire out instead of trying to put a large one out makes a lot more sense. Um, if you see attachment two in the file that I gave you, you'll see pictures of the fire that started. Which they let go for a week. They put a uh, team of pack horses up there to inspect it. I'm well aware of the terrain and where this fire was because I took care of the water rights in Campbell and Cliff Lake for 10 years at another job that I had. Um, this fire could have been controlled and put out with several drops from a helicopter or knocked back for a week's worth of look. We had a meeting at Quartz Valley School and they uh, said they didn't have air tact available. Well, they could have done that. They could have. There was 150 people in that room. They didn't satisfy anybody that night. Okay. Um, the ability to, uh, the, the lack of listening to the land stewards. You know, I'm a good land steward. I have 80 acres of old growth timber. Um, I'm also an equipment operator, well versed on logging roads and everything. Okay, um, the availability of logging road above my property, which made a tremendously good contingency line. That's attachment three, if you'd like to look at that. Um, the aggressive personality of the guy that came to my yard, talked to my wife, disturbed her so bad they were going to burn from our backyard, which would have left three acres in the green, the rest of my 80 in the black. The fire was still six or seven miles from our house. I met with the man, he was very adamant, said they will do this, this is what they were going to do. Aggressive personality on the Cal Fire side, not willing to listen to a land steward or my neighbors. Um, the contingency line, I met with a smoke jumper from Alaska which they assigned to me for the next day to discuss a contingency line. He told me it was a line on the, uh, in the office for a budget building process. It was 30 miles of line that went from Scott River to Patterson Creek through people's properties, destroyed everything in its site. And like I said, I've logged, I'm an equipment operator, I do know what it's supposed to look like. Okay, the devastation, attachment four, if you look at some of their devastation on my property, um, they, uh, inexperienced operators, you, know, you can push a tree over without covering up with dirt, making it non-merchantable. You don't cover them up with dirt. You don't push dirt 30 or 40 yards off the road if you're trying to build a road. You can't get it back. Besides, you cause uh, water issues later. Okay, they said there was a lack of water. There was 38 water tenders on this fire. Um, they definitely had water trucks. They must have had water. Keeping in mind, I said I controlled the water in Campbell Lake. The pond that they were dipping out of is water from Campbell Lake. The landowner that has that water, which I can obtain a deposition from, said there wasn't a lack of water. He told them all the water they could use, and which they did, finally. The dust problem, um, over 100 vehicles a day in front of my house. With 38 water tenders, couldn't they keep from putting an eighth inch of dust on everything I own? No, they didn't think of that. Their aggressive personality was taking hold here. Okay, the soil displacement, you can't get it back when it's 30 or 40 yards off the road. Okay, you can look at attachment four on the, the damage. I think I already you know, brought that up. Okay, and then and my next thing, number three, is a waste of manpower and equipment. Um, I have some pictures of some representatives or hired employees from CAL FIRE playing horseshoes in my backyard. Is this putting out a fire? No, it's not. A crew buses camping in my orchard two days after the incident command center was gone out of Mill Creek. They moved on to Scott River. Okay, another incident, a CAL FIRE truck, a one-ton truck with a CAL FIRE insignia dumped a pickup load of Gatorade and batteries in the Siskiyou County landfill. Somebody tried to get the newspaper to go, you know, report this. The newspaper wouldn't touch it. Didn't want to handle that, didn't want to battle that battle. That could have been given to a homeless shelter 
or anything like that. I mean, we're all going broke together here. Let's kind of not waste, you know. They were pumping over a million dollars a day into this fire when it could have been put out with the helicopter drops. Okay, um, the inexperienced operators, I kind of already touched on that a little bit. Um, the neighboring line, they destroyed my neighbor's property to the tune of seven loads of logs, consequently causing them to have to file a harvest plan to be able to utilize those logs. Um, I've discussed this with my neighbors, with all of my neighbors. They're all up to speed on this. They know, you know, that, that things went south in a hurry. Um, the things that I did in, uh, oh, and the, the narrow road through my place, uh, the, um, if you look at attachment five, this is what they ended up with versus the logging road that was above it. Um, the canopy grows clear back over this thing. They didn't touch anything. That proves it was a line on a map for a budget building process. Two pickups couldn't pass on this road that they call there a contingency line. Two could pass very easily on the road above my place. They just needed to do this 30 miles a line and they were focused and not willing to listen to what I had to say or any of my neighbors. Okay, the extra things that I did um, I fixed a water line for my neighbors with my backhoe and my own equipment at no cost to them because one of their contract crews mowed over a water system, dumping their spring water tank so they had absolutely no water or no means of that. Cal Fire did bring water for their tank after I fixed it. Okay, Offering to repair a culvert on a roadway, I have equipment, I have a backhoe and a grader. I have the ability in welders and steel to fix this culvert. I met with them. I told them I will fix that culvert at no cost to anybody. The next day, that wasn't good enough. They replaced six, uh, 40 feet of culvert, put a 30-inch pipe in underneath the road. That entailed seven Cal Fire employees, four, four service employees, two loads of crush, and a four service backhoe. That's a lot of money tied up there. For what reason? When I said I would fix it for nothing, the only people that were using this road was my neighbors, myself, and Cal Fire. You know, there's a definite money problem here. Okay, um, then I graded all of the crossover roads in my place before Cal Fire got there. My place is crossroads for fire protection reason. It has been for years. I fired up my own grader, graded it down to the dirt. They weren't even willing to look at what I've done. They didn't even consider that. They just flat told me, no, this is how it was going to be. Okay, the conservation and cleanup after the path of destruction, I met with a CAL FIRE representative. He asked, what would you like to happen here? I said, you bring everything that you tore up up on the road, cut it into 16-inch firewood so I can utilize it or get rid of it. He flat told me, no, this is not going to happen. Okay. Um, Consequently, they pulled everything up on the road, left it for a path of destruction. I cut 20 quart of firewood off of it last year. I'm still cleaning it up. I'm not the kind of person that goes out and throws good money after bad. I'm not going to hire a crew to come in and cut all this up and clean it up. I will do it myself. The dry fire year, I can't burn it. I have to deal with it. Hopefully this winter will be a wet one and I can finish dealing with this problem. It's definitely a real problem. The completion dates, like I said, hopefully next year, beginning of next year. Okay, water course management. There's a berm on the outs on both sides of this road that they put in, all the way. The water cannot go anywhere. When it does decide, it will pool and wash. That's erosion. The corners that they went around, the draws, they didn't rock them or straw them. Like I said, I'm an equipment operator. I'm a good land steward. I know when soil's going to move when it's wet. Common knowledge here. Okay, the last thing on my list is the f um, financial fairness. The, the bill that I put in, $30 an hour for my backhoe time while I'm cleaning this mess up, that's about probably 50% of what a backhoe would actually run for. You know, I'm fair on this deal. Um, the use of my own equipment, I stated I did the other stuff. I said I would fix the culvert everything else. And uh, the last thing is the loss of wages. I had to take a week off because I realized that Cal Fire would have burned my place if I wasn't home. Their track record isn't very good. They burn people's places and there's green streaks between where they burned 
and where the fire ended. That wasn't going to happen on my old growth timber. Um, years ago, I purchased this place from my father-in-law. I shook an old man's hand that was 80 years old and said I would guard it and protect it. At this point, my handshake doesn't mean anything if I let somebody come in there and totally destroy what I was there to protect. Thank you for your consideration on this matter, and I hope I've enlightened you on some of the things that's actually going on on these fires. And um, Cal Fire is to be commended on the job that they're doing on these fires this year. You know, I don't, I don't degrade them about their job. They definitely have a very tough job. Um, but they also need to realize that personal property and human rights are more important than the Sparky and the fire truck, you know? I mean, they were so focused and so out of line when they came to my house and I met with them that it's uncontrollable. I do have two uh, brother-in-laws that were uh, um, retired from CDF. One of them was a battalion chief. So I'm kind of well-versed on the inside working of the CAL FIRE. I realize that their budget is based on what they spend the next year. Well, you don't throw a million dollars a day after something that could have been solved very easily in the first five days. If you look at the first picture or the second picture of just the smoke, I have more pictures like that of day after day. So um, I would like your consideration on this matter. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Mr. Donaton? Uh, yes, uh, CAL FIRE agrees with the board's decision. Um, the alleged actions of CAL FIRE that are subject to this claim request uh, fall under the previously cited government code sections. Um, according to the unit chief uh, in, in the region, in the, in the unit where the fire occurred, the firefighters were acting within the scope of their employment. Um, CAL FIRE's actions subject to this claim were prudent, common, uh, and the best practice within wildland fire suppression agencies and all the strategies involved in fighting this fire um, were decided by the Unified Incident Command, which is a collaboration between state and federal firefighting agencies. Thank you, Mr. Donaton. Um, is there any discussion on this item? No, I'll move staff recommendation. I second that. Thank you very much for coming here today. Thank you for your time today. Bliss, is anybody here for item number 98? I believe Mr. Hall is back in is back in the room. I'll introduce the item and also um, is Mr. Hall here? Okay. Item ninety eight is the claim of Justin M. Carter. Mr. Carter claims damages from the California Department of Corrections and Re Rehabilitation in an amount exceeding twenty five thousand dollars for wrongful arrest, false imprisonment, and malicious prosecution. Program staff recommends the claim be rejected because it raises complex issues of fact and law beyond the scope and analysis of interpretation typically undertaken by the board. Representing Mr. Carter is Mr. Anthony Hall, and representing CDCR is Ms. Melanie Yang. Thank you. Mr. Hall? You can go ahead. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, members of the board. Um, I did get a chance to receive your notice of the meeting this morning, and of course, again, it does provide at page three uh, on item number 898, the re recommendation was to reject the claim, again. Uh, however, uh, what I did have for the presentation of today's meeting or hearing is my armor notes in which I will be following from there. Um, this case stems from my client, Mr. Carter, who was arrested and imprisoned by uh, parole agent Fernando Cisneros. Um, the parole violation stemming from Mr. Um, Cisneros' parole hold that was placed on Mr. Carter uh, did, in fact, result in a dismissal. Uh, of course, after his third appearance uh, from the date of his arrest, July 7th of 2014. 
Now, the time in which Mr. Carter did reside in custody uh, was a maximum of total of 24 days uh, prior to his release after the disposition of the case in the criminal case, uh, which of course resulted in his favor. I believe the board has an ability to grant this claim rather than reject this claim. Mr. Carter's rights was in fact violated pursuant to the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution and also rights violated pursuant to the California Constitution under Article I, Declaration of Rights. Specifically to Section 13, which says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable seizures and searches may not be violated, and a warrant may not issue it except on probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons and things to be seized. In the present case, again, Mr. Carter was arrested. There was no probable cause for Mr. Carter's arrest other than the ill intentions of Mr. Carter's pro-agent, Fernando Cisneros. Pursuant to 15 California Code of Regulations, Section 3750, which provides the authority to place a parole hold, and of course it does state. If the parole agent has probable cause as described in section 3753, to believe the parolee has violated conditions of parole or of the law, the parole agent may arrest the parolee without a warrant at any time during the period of parole supervision and bring him or her before the court for final adjudication pursuant to penal code section 1203.2. Again, in this case, M Mr. Fernando Cisneros had no cause to call Mr. Carter's arrest July 7, 2014. Apparently, there was no probable cause because the case did, in fact, result in a favorable outcome for my client, Mr. Carter. There has also been issues relating to where these allegations stem from relating to the false arrest and the motive behind Mr. Fernando Cisneros, the parole agent of Mr. Carter. And I know I didn't get a chance to submit certain documentation to this board, even though I know I have submitted some. And of course, there has been issues to where Mr. Carter has wanted to challenge these conditions of parole especially where there has been a continuous adverse effect upon him by the parole agent, Mr. Fernando Cisneros. And of course, uh, ratified by his colleagues. Now this claim was in fact submitted on August the 12th, 2014. And of course, there has been some issues relating to the receival of any receipt, uh, especially where um, it says a processing fee relating to the fee filing a processing fee of $25 is required to file a claim. And of course, that claim was filed. However, I have not yet to receive a copy or a receipt of the $25 that was in fact submitted and paid, even though there was an, uh, a fee waiver initially submitted with the application August 12, 2014.
And I do have a copy, an additional copy for the board uh, that I'll be showing to the gentleman to my left, uh, dated February 21st, 2015. Uh, and this is relating to the claim and the issues and we are having received a response uh, and also defenses raised on and for Mr. Carter. Now in the rejection of the board's, this letter that uh, I did in fact receive dated September the 12th, 2014, uh, it mentions the documents you submitted on August 12th, 2014 failed to comply with government code section 905.2 subdivision C. And of course it goes on to say, if you wish to file a claim with the government claims program, please submit the $25 filing fee by check or money order made payable to the victim compensation the government claims board. The document which I just handed to Mr. Sir on my left, uh, dated February 21st, 2015, shows in fact a check uh, in the amount of $25, check number 2001, dated and signed by me. Now, in the recommending of the rejection of the late claim, however, there hasn't been a response um, from the board as to why it has decided to reject Mr. Carter's claim. I do believe also that going back to the pro hold where we where we just mentioned something about the reasonable or probable cause. Now in this pleading that I have, that I just barely completed this morning, right before this meeting, this, and I didn't get a chance to make copies for the board, but I did get a chance to get it stamped. Thank you, Mr. Hall, I don't wanna cut you off, but please just maybe one more minute and that's it. We have many more items on the agenda. Concerns of Government Code Section 815.2, Subdivision A. It says a public entity is liable for injury proximately caused by an act or omission of an employee of the public entity within the scope of his employment if the act or omission would apart, would apart from this section have given rise to a cause of action <coughs> against that employee or his personal representative. In this case, there is apparently a complaint cause of action that is being initiated on behalf of my client, Mr. Carter. And I believe also that um, the person representing Mr. Fernando Cisneros and the Pro and Community Services Division may allege that there may be an immunity on behalf of Fernando Cisneros, Pro Agent for client Justin Carter. Now, in the case decision of Swift versus California, 384 F 3rd 1184 decision in 2004, where in the court's opinion it provides that, and this is where Michael Swift appeals the district court's dismissal of his 42 U.S.C. 1983 action against two California parole officers. Swift alleges that his Fourth Amendment rights were violated as a result of, one, the officer's investigation of suspected parole violations, two, the officer's ordering Swift's arrest pursuant to a parole hold, and three, the recommendation for the initiation of parole revocation proceedings. The district court found the officers entitled to absolute immunity under Selders versus Procuniar. We have jurisdiction pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1291 and conclude with the office, that the officer's right 
to immunity is not controlled by these cases. Applying the functional approach to absolute immunity in accordance with Antoine versus Byers and Anderson. However, in Miller's Gamey 335 F3rd 889, which is a Ninth Circuit precedent, uh, decided 2003 in Bank, where they held that parole officers are not absolutely immune from suits arising from conduct distinct from the decision to grant, deny, or revoke parole. And of course, accordingly, they reversed the decision of the district court, the lower court. In this case, <laughs> excuse me, in this case, the people's to my right, uh, representing Mr. Fernando Cisneros, may allege that they, there is immunity for Mr. Cisneros. But from the case decision, which I just got the reading, uh, states otherwise. Uh, this board is bound by the decision held by the Ninth, the Ninth Circuit, as well as any decisions decided by the California Supreme Court, as well as our United States Supreme Court. And of course, um, Mr. Hall, I'm getting sorry. ready to close. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. And in closing, I hereby request the board to ensure justice starts now in this and future cases that is within the California Victim Compensation Board Authority and jurisdiction to ensure litigation is not made another avenue to curtail my client's right. The people that this board oversees can correct these injuries or the injuries which are oppressive to my client. To want a parolee to remain homeless when my client has family relatives, some with children, others without, who has opened their doors. To my client, Mr. Justin Carter, the claimant. Yet has some or most turned away because of the threats and by my client's parole agent, Fernando Cisneros. And also through his colleagues and who deals with Mr. Carter presently since my client's last visit to the Parole and Community Services Division situated there at 1103 North B Street. Mr. Carter has been false told by the Parole and Community Services Division agents, including Mr. Cisneros, that Mr. Carter's controlling discharge date is June 25th of 2018. Accordingly to the SAC court website, it appears he was sentenced to a pro term of three years. Mr. Carter's sentencing occurred on 6-17-2011, which would put his, put his discharge date around the year 2016. So, 16. so the information appeared to be false. And I did get a chance to go to the SAC court website to pull up that information, and it does show that he was sentenced 6-17-2011 to three years, and of course, um, but getting to the matter at hand, I believe that this board would have jurisdiction to grant the claim uh, on behalf of Mr. Carter, on behalf of what was just shared to you today. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Thank you for your comments. Ms. Yang? Thank you, Madam Chairperson, board member. Melanie Yang, representing California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. We do not have any position on the merits of the claim today. We recommend that the board adopt the staff's recommendation to reject as complex. This matter involves complex legal issues. Thank you. Thank you both for your comments. Is there any discussion on this item? Yeah, I will be objecting to the issue about her mentioning something about this being a complex item. Uh, I don't believe this matter is complex. I do believe it was just a, a case to where a parole officer engaged in an arrest. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. A lawful, an unlawful arrest, that is. <laughs> Thank we you. resulted again in his favor. Thank you. Do I have a motion on item number 98? Staff recommendation. I second that. Thank you very much for coming here today, both of you. Okay. So what would be the recommendation of the board? Because I didn't catch the recommendation of the board. That the matter is rejected. Okay. So that will then open the door for Mr. Carter to pursue his lawsuit in yes. state court. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's move to item number six on the agenda. It's the request for continuation of the government claims program, California Highway Patrol program. Nicholas, would you please brief us on this item? Yes, the California Highway Patrol program delegates authority to the VCGCB executive officer to evaluate and decide CHP claims that meet specified criteria. Staff recommends that the board approve the continuation of the CHP program for a three-year period concluding September 30th, 2018. If the board members have questions, uh, CHP is represented by Sergeant Ron Wade. Thank you. Would 
There, Mr. Mr. Wade is not going to make a comment. He's here if the board members have questions of him. Is there anyone who would like to address the board on this item? Any questions? No, no questions. Okay. I'll move uh, approval of the item. I second that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, board members. You're welcome. Item number seven is, um, well, I've been, it's the applications for discharge from accountability for collection, and I've been informed that there are no applications for discharge from accountability for collection this month. So let's move to item number eight. It's the claim of John Smith, Penal Code Section 4900. Uh, Wayne, would you please brief us on this item? Yes, in 1994, uh, Mr. Smith was convicted of murder, attempted murder, and two enhancements, and he was sentenced to 29 years to life in prison. In 2010, during a habeas corpus hearing, it was determined the surviving victim testified falsely at trial. Mr. Smith's habeas was granted, and he was released from prison. Later, Los Angeles uh, County District Attorney conceded that Smith established his innocence by a preponderance of the evidence. The Attorney General believes Smith has met his burden under 4900, the penal code, and the hearing officer recommends granting this claim. And the amount uh, owed to Mr. Smith, uh, if you approve the proposed decision, is $653,600. Um, Mr. Smith is present along with his, uh, uh, his representative, Dave McLean, and also from the Attorney General's office is Lorena, Loren, Lorenda De La Ini. Thank you very much. Mr. McLean, would you like to make some comments to the board? Um, Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, Chairwoman, and the Board. We would submit on um, what both the Attorney General's recommendation is, that the 4900 claim be granted, and also the um, representative of the Claims Board, that the proposed decision that um, the claim be granted. Um, as been determined by all fact finders from the DA's office who originally investigated the case to Ms. Delaney who investigated for the Attorney General and from the uh, Attorney General representative all agree that Mr. Smith here stands as an innocent person and deserves to be compensated and um, I just for the record um, um, Madam Chairwoman, Chairwoman and Mr. Chavarro, uh, Deirdre O'Connor, who represented Mr. Uh, Smith on the original habeas, she's sitting here to my left. Um, she's from Innocent Matters. And so everyone's in agreement on this claim, Madam Chairwoman, that it should be granted. And unless the court, uh, the board has any questions <coughs> for me, I'm Excuse more than happy to answer them. And I think Ms. Delaney can answer them as well. But I would submit on the recommendation. Thank you very much. Ms. Delaney, do you have any comments? Or? I do, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman and Board Member Shavaro, the Attorney General's Office believes that Mr. Smith has met his burden under Penal Code Section 4900. The facts of this case are somewhat disturbing and briefly are that Mr. Smith was charged with murder and attempted murder stemming from a drive-by shooting. He was identified by the only surviving victim, Landu Mavwemba, as being the shooter. Mr. Mavwemba has consistently changed his testimony. His credibility is <clears throat> also at issue. He now stands convicted of forcible rape and other sex crimes and is in prison. He maintained at trial that Mr. Smith was the shooter. However, he subsequently recanted his identification, admitted that he never saw the shooter because the shooting happened so fast. During the state habeas proceedings, the Superior Court made a specific credibility determination, which is binding on this board, that Mr. Mavwemba perjured himself. Still, while Mr. Mavwemba's statements are inconsistent and varied, Mr. Smith has consistently maintained his innocence. The Attorney General's Office had an opportunity to interview Mr. Smith, and when we did, he did not ask for any immunity or any limitations on the interview that we conducted with him. The Attorney General's Office found Mr. Smith to be extremely credible, and because of his credibility and Mr. Movemba's inconsistent statements, we believe that he has met his burden under the statute. One thing that is important for the Attorney General's Office to note is that even though this board is bound by the credibility determinations that the court made pursuant to Penal Code Section 1485.5 Subdivision C, 
without that credibility determination, the Attorney General's office believes that Mr. Smith has still met his burden under the statute and that he should be compensated in the amount of $633,500. Anything else, Mr. McLean, or you submit? I believe the correct amount is $653,000, but nothing further unless the board has... No, I move approval of the claim. I second that. Thank you very much for your comments and for coming here today. Thank you. Let's move to item number nine, is Penal Code Section 4900 claim of O.B. Stephen Anthon III. Wayne, would you please brief us on this item? In 1995, Mr. Anthony was convicted of murder in two counts of attempted murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. In 2011, Mr. Anthony's conviction was reversed based on the grounds of ineffective assistance of counsel, false testimony, and prosecutorial misconduct. In 2014, a Los Angeles Superior Court judge made a finding of factual innocence pursuant to Penal Code Section 1485.55b. Based on that, the law directs the board to approve this claim. We recommend to the legislature that Mr. Anthony be paid $581,600. Today, present for Mr. Anthony is Dave McLean. Mr. Anthony is present, and also Craig Myers from the Attorney General's Office. Thank you very much. Would anyone like to address the board? Your Honor, Dave McLean, present for Mr. Anthony, but Paige Kaneb, who is co-counsel from the Northern California Innocence Project, is going to speak on behalf of Mr. Anthony. Thank you, Chairperson and Board Member Shavaro and Chief Counsel Strumpfer. My name is Paige Kaneb. I'm here on behalf of the Northern California Innocence Project and Mr. Anthony. We agree with everything Mr. Strumpfer said and will submit on the proposed decision. Thank you very much. Mr. Myers? Thank you. Good morning, Board Members. Craig Myers with the Attorney General's Office. Based on the finding of the Superior Court on May 30, 2014, the Attorney General has to submit on the matter and accept the proposed decision. And I'll move that the claim be approved. I second the motion. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this closes the government claims program portion of our meeting, and we will now move to the victim compensation program portion of our agenda. So we move into closed session. Thank you.